All right, welcome back to our next high production value lecture video. We're going to be talking about evolution, evidence of evolution, what evolution means, and where we see it in our society now. So this is our biological concept lecture video. Talking about the evidence of evolution, we see this all over the place now, of course, because of our scientific inquiry that we've done over the past several hundred years, looking at genetic lineage, trying to figure out where things came from and also where they are going. Evolution is inevitable. It happens all the time. It happens because of factors both external and internal. So evocation, uh, evolution has occurred throughout the history of living beings, right? It is deduced by studying things that are prehistoric, like fossils that we find, DNA, other evidence like rock shelves, trees, right? Looking at rings and tree trunks, things like that, right? Evolution is where we see changes in genetic coding. So we have natural selection that is going to lead to reproductive barriers, things like mountain ranges in between a species, breaking off of islands, right? When we had continental drift and species were sent awry away from other members of the same species to develop a completely different genetic profile, right? So we have barriers to reproduction. We also have specific environmental things that dictate developmental changes like climate, right? Those things are going to pick for specific traits that are more conducive to survival there. So to have evolution, we have to have genetic variation. Genetic variation is going to be a change in genotype in a certain species. So the species is going to develop because of these factors, right? Species is going to happen and speciation is going to happen because of genetic variability. So our first mechanism that we usually go to when we talk about evolution is analysis of the past. And that is going to start with fossils. Looking at fossils can give us a lot of different things. Okay? It can give us a lot of different variability. It can give us a lot of information about what things were like what they are like now and what they could be like in the future, okay? So here are a selection of pictures that are going to be fossil-esque. We have things like petrified wood in the desert, right? We have implants or imprintations of things like fish and leaves and plants on rocks and sediment, right? We also have physical fossils and physical skeletons like the bones here of a triceratops, right? We have a leaf, okay, in the top right, Looks like we have maybe an arthropod or something like that. We can even see excrement uh, fossilized. So we have something like the uh, feces of a turtle that we potentially find. And from these things, we can get genetic information, right? We can see genomes and we can get genetic profiling to see what changes were happening. So here is our relative history of Earth pretty much. Earth, the origin of Earth as we know it, happened about 4.6 billion years ago, okay? So the formation of the rock itself came into being around this time. For a vast majority of the time until the present, there was no living species. There was no living beings on the surface of the Earth, okay? The first living creatures started out in the water. So first living beings, first living creatures, organisms started out actually in water sources. So there were not any land dwelling creatures before that. We had to have start out in water. So when we talk about the speciation, all right? Speciation happened over time. Development of different species and different lineages was very rapid in the past 100, 200 million years. Right, much, much faster than it was for the previous three and a half, four billion years beforehand. So we go through a couple of the layerings here. When we look at our current era, right, this is what is known as the Cenozoic era, also known as the age of the mammals. Only for about the last 10,000 years or so have we seen normal human civilization and normal humans as we know them now, right? 
So for roughly the past 10,000 years, human beings are as they are now and have been in this pretty much the same construction, right? Similar genetic codes. Before that, about 2.6 million years ago, we saw the implantation of large mammals and homo sapiens, right? So homo sapiens were the um, first erect, modern looking humans that existed, right? We also saw large mammals during this time, things like mammoths, right? There were also a couple of ice ages that really hindered the growth of a lot of things during that time. Then we had the Neogene period, which was before this, right? Anywhere from about 24 million years ago up until 2.6 million. Here's where we saw the first large mammals, right? We saw the first um, apes and things like that, gorillas, things like that come into play, right? Diversification happened. Modern birds began to progress. Before that, we had the Paleogene period, which one of the main things that come into contact here as far as the Paleogene is concerned is the evolution or the, the first sightings of, of primates, right? We had the first mammals and the first primates that existed in this period, right? Anywhere from about 64 to 23 million years ago. Before that, we did not really have much of what our modern society, our modern animal kingdom looks like, right? Before that, we had what was called the Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic era was an age of reptiles, so to speak. We know that we had a great extinction event or a large extinction event that happened around 65 million years ago, which is what we typically identify as the end of the age of the dinosaurs and the beginning of the age of the modern, whatever, modern animals that exist on the earth. So during the Mesozoic era, we had the periods of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, right? Those were large periods of dinosaur frivolity or um, vitality during that time. Anywhere from about 200 million years ago up until 65 million years ago, there were widespread dinosaur populations, okay? We had the first birds, first flying um, mammals, all right, first uh, giant reptiles that were around first flowering plants during this time period. At the beginning of the Mesozoic era, around 250 million years ago, we saw the Triassic period. This is where the first actual dinosaurs began to develop, the first large dinosaurs, the first mammal ancestors, which were known as the therapsids. And we also first saw forests come into play. In the earliest portion, as far as um, life and, and animals and, and things that were uh, actively growing is concerned was the Paleozoic. And the Paleozoic era is really where we saw the first diversification and thriving of actual animal populations. So the Paleozoic era, we saw the start of animals as they are now in the water, okay? So we first saw in the Cambrian and Orvician, uh, Orvician periods, we saw things like sponges and jellyfish, jawless fish, right? invertebrates, algae, things like that in the water. Then getting up into the Silurian and Devonian periods, we saw the first bones in animals, right? We saw the first fish that had bony structures, right? We saw the first seeding plants on land. We saw the first vascular plants and initially saw the first terrestrial invertebrates. Then in the beginning, or sorry, at the end of the Paleozoic, we saw the Carboniferous and Permian periods. This is where we really saw the proliferation of animals outside of the water. Right? So this is where we first saw reptiles, large plant populations on land, diversification of amphibians, insects, first winged insects, really the first large population of 
beings and life outside of the water that we had had at that time. Before that, before the Paleozoic era, from the time about 2.5 billion to 500 million years ago, right? This is known as the Proterozoic Eon. This is going to be a time where the Earth actually starts becoming suitable for life. Okay. So at this time, we saw the growth of the first living organisms, first multicellular organisms, first bacteria, first fungus, first things that were able to actually start producing oxygen. So we saw oxygen start to accumulate in the environment because of photosynthesis. Now, before this, from about 3.8 billion to 2.5 billion years ago, this is our first initial contact of life, right? So during this time period, we had the first bacteria in archaea form, right? That was all that grew during this time period. So we had bacteria present for about this 1.3 billion year population. And during that time, the only things that were potentially alive on the Earth's surface were bacteria and archaea. Then earlier than that, we had the Hadean Eon, which was from the formation of Earth until about 3.8 billion years ago. During that time, there was nothing at all. The Earth was forming. Um, the environment, the atmosphere, everything was not suitable for any sort of living creature. So during that time, there was nothing that was alive. The Earth was simply just a rock floating and forming its atmosphere at that time. So we see basically that life as we know it didn't really start until around the end of that Archeon Eon. Right? So we first started to get funguses and uh, first organisms that could produce oxygen and put it into the atmosphere during that time. So for the first 2.1 billion years or so of Earth's formation, there was not really a suitable atmosphere for plants and animals to actually exist. So here is another example of fossilization. You see ammonite fossils here. Right? Ammonite fossils are typically amphibian, typically looked at as coming from water uh, or an area that had water previously. These were ammonite fossils that were found in Oklahoma. Right? Oklahoma is very much a landlocked state, but that is indicating that at this area or at this site of digging, at one point, this area was actually covered by ocean or covered by a body of water. So do we look at fossil lineages and can we see transitional forms, right? Meaning, can we see hybrids of things in fossils? The answer is, is, is yes, we can see this, okay? So the fossil record is going to be the most complete for groups that have evolved recently, right? because they have things that we can have and that we can find that are preserved over time, like bones and teeth and other things that fossilize readily and that maintain their shape and integrity, okay? So we have excellent evidence for fish, um, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, things that have teeth and, and, and bones and backbones of this. The fossil record does contain a lot of gaps though. So the most prominent example of this was going to be at the Cambrian explosion, right? Which is where we have um, several hundred million years ago, okay? This phase is going to be referring not to a cataclysmic event, but however, it is the time that we had many new groups of animals appear in the ocean, okay? So fossils from the Cambrian explosion are going to be sort of selective and not all encompassing because this was truly a time of rapid evolutionary change, right? And that rapid evolutionary change was because we had the first change or the first transition of animals coming from the ocean and moving on to land. So fossils from this time period are going to be sparse. So we can estimate fossil aging in two ways. One is relative dating, the other is absolute and radioactive decay. 
Relative dating is going to be assigning a fossil because of a series of events that happened around it. Right? It's usually based on presumptions. And usually we can do it based off of the rock strata or how deep we found the fossil within the earth. So this of course is going to assume that the further down we found the fossil, the longer ago the organism lived. So relative dating can place fossils in, in an order from oldest to youngest and can put them in a relative period or maybe a, 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 an eon um, that we know that they are probably within, but it's not going to give us an exact date. For absolute dating and radioactive dating, this is going to be uh, much more precise. So we can test whether the fossil or the sediments above and below the fossil um, are going to have a specific date. So we usually have that date expressed relative to the present. So if we're looking at dinosaurs or something like that, and we see a photo and we are going to have it dated to about 160 million years ago. That is going to be a, a roughly 160 million years before the present date. Radioactive dating is going to look at chemical half-flux, so it's going to be pretty accurate. We're using radioactive isotopes as a sort of clock to see. So we try and see isotopes within a fossil we try and see isotopes that are naturally unstable and emit radiation. So we can see each different radioactive isotope has a particular and unchangeable rate of decay known as a half-life. So if we look at a half-life of an isotope, and we are able to determine that, then over time we can see how long it has been around and how much of it was present at the original time that it first deca started decaying. So one example of this that we see is going to be carbon-14 dating. All right. Carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon, which is usually carbon-12. The radioactive form carbon-14 is going to be unstable and therefore it decays at a appreciable rate. The half-life of it is relatively long and about 5,700 years. So at the time of life, a particular organism is going to incorporate both standard carbon and carbon-14, all right? After an organism dies, the bone that is there is going to have a proportion of carbon-14 left over. So at the time of death, we can start to analyze how long it has been since that death event by looking at the proportion of carbon-14. So while carbon-14 declines, however much is left over, can give us the amount of time that it's been since it started to decline. So for instance, if we have three half-lives since death, we will have a certain amount of carbon-14 left over. So here's a couple of terminologies based on referencing a fossil's age. Fossil is going to be evidence of an organism that existed more than 10,000 years ago. That is the definition. Our relative dating is using other things to try and sequence events together to put us at a specific time period, such as looking at rock strata, right? The typical, if this is further down, it's usually older type of thing. Absolute dating is going to look at a possible rate, a uh, possible range of dates. The common method here is going to be made here radiometric dating, right? And that's our radioactive isotopes. So radioactive isotope is going to be the unstable isotope that we use to estimate age because it emits radiation that decays at a certain appreciable rate. That rate is known as the half-life. And that is the time that it takes for half of the atoms in a sample of a radioactive substance to decay. So we know that the half-life for a specific 
isotope is constant. So here's our continental drift or continental change that we saw right over time. During periods long, long ago, uh, at one point, we did have what was called Pangaea. And Pangaea was pretty much the combination of all of our continents into one, right? So anywhere from 300 million to 200 million years ago, all the continents were joined together into one large landmass known as Pangaea. About 180 million years ago or so, we had a breaking off of one continent from another. So we had two major continents form with a separation of the ocean between them. They were known as Laurasia and Gondwana. Then at about 100 million years ago or so, we started to see the formation of our present day continents. So we started to see continental drift. Those land masses started to break apart and move to their separate locations. And then today we finally see our continents left over. So continental drift is going to allow for speciation to occur. It also explains modern day fossil distribution. So for example, if we have fossils in South America that are going to represent life that is typically found in the African subcontinent, that is because at one point, South America and Africa were joined and they broke apart, right? So originally, animal species that existed on both of these continents were living on the same land. And once the continent split, we saw a part of that species integrate into South America and part of it stayed in Africa. And that is going to be why we have this change. So a good representation of this is going to be what we call Wallace's line. And this is based off of Alfred Russell Wallace. Traveled around the uh, archipelago here, he noticed a distinct pattern of animal life on one side of an imaginary border versus another. So this imaginary border, what is known as Wallace's line, on one side had an animal population that was much more like Asia. And on the other side had an animal population that is much more like Australia. So for instance, west of the line, there were a larger population of tigers, rhinos, elephants, leopards, orangutans, thrushes, things like that. Whereas east of the line, we saw a lot more things like kangaroos, deer, and brush turkeys and things that are usually associated with Australia. All right, now we talk about homologous structures. Homologous structures are shared lineages that look like they are consistent across many different species. So a term homologous means that they are similar, it's like similarities between certain species and may indicate a common ancestor. Okay, so the organization of the vertebrate skeleton is one that illustrates this homology. All of our vertebrate skeletons support the body. And for something like the arm, we see a basic construct of a bony outlay that is going to be similar across species. So for example, amphibians, birds, other reptiles and mammals typically have four limbs, okay? And the number and positions of the bones that make up those appendages are going to be very similar. Simply, uh, simplest explanation of this is that we did see a common ancestor at one time, and then we just had gradual modification in each group as they separated out into their different environments. So we see these four limbs, right? And in each of these animals, the bat, the lion, the seal, right, the hawk, we have a similar construct as far as long bone, long bone, and then short bones at a joint, and then fingers slash 
appendages slash phalanges. All right, so this is the evolutionary view as far as something that is pretty common, the hiccup, right? The hiccup is going to be uh, something that is not terribly important to our evolutionary um, design. However, it does still happen. It's an involuntary muscle spasm of the diaphragm, all right, causing someone to inhale sharp. They result from irritation of the phrenic nerve, and this triggers that contraction. Great distance between the origin of the phrenic nerve and the diaphragm offers many opportunities for irritation. So more practical arrangement would have been for the nerves that control breathing to emerge from the spinal cord near the diaphragm, but we inherited these nerves from the fish. Uh, and our fish ancestors have gills that are very close to the neck, right? And those gills are near where the breathing control mechanism in the nerves emerge. So here, as far as the fish is concerned, we see that the phrenic nerve is very close to the gills where this breathing mechanism is. In humans, however, the phrenic nerve is going to be originating from the brainstem and it has to travel all the way down to the diaphragm, which is a far distance away from it. All right, we also talk about vestigial structures. So when we talk about homologous structures, vestigial structures are there as well. Vestigial structures, for example, here, A, we have a mole's eye, right? A mole's tiny vestigial eyes are covered with skin and fur, okay? You know that moles are blind. They live underground, they dig. Their eyes are not necessarily important because they don't really have a function. However, they are still there which means that they came from an ancestor at one point that did have the ability to see. Another one would be boa constrictors, right? Boa constrictors in some snakes have vestigial hind limbs, meaning that at one point there was a common ancestor that had other appendages, not just a straight tube-like body. All right, for whales, okay, we see that modern whales have a small bony protrusion at the base of their spine that is going to mimic what a hind limb would look like or a lower appendage would look like. So a whale ancestor might have had four limbs at some point. All right, so this is the concept of convergent versus divergent evolution. Convergent evolution is going to be species that come together and form common traits, All right? So here are some examples. We see the blind salamander on the top left. These are cave animals. We see the crayfish as well. Right? These are both from Florida. They both lack eyes and pigment. So they are in the same environment, different species, but they're going to have similar structures and similar designs because of their environment. Again, here we see the cacti, right? There's the cacti in the desert in Mexico on the left. They have adaptations similar to the euphorbia plants in the Namib Desert in Africa on the right. They are going to be similar because they develop in similar environments. So let's look at some comparative anatomy. Homologous structures. These are features that are going to occur in two or more species and share similarities, such as our limbs, such as the bones, the bony structure of our limbs. A vestigial structure is going to be a feature that is still present that has no apparent function that indicates that something ancestrally had a functional feature there. Right? It was a functional feature at some point in the ancestry of that animal. And analogous structures, are going to be ones that occur in two or more species that are superficially similar, but are going to be the product of a convergent evolution, meaning that they arose independently, but they developed in a way or in a place that required similar traits to develop. So here we're looking at another example, right? This is what we call same parts different proportions. So as far as a fetus is concerned, 
the fetal human and the fetal chimpanzee, the skulls are remarkably similar in their design. But we see as we reach adulthood, the adult chimpanzee and the adult human skull structures are going to be pretty different, all right? So we see growth at different parts. For the chimpanzee, the lower jaw, the oral cavity, and the protrusion around the eyes is going to be quite large, right? So we see a lot more bony growth there. And the skull portion around the cranium is going to be smaller in comparison to that of the human. So the fetuses have similar skulls, but the different parts grow at different rates. So therefore, one part is a little bit larger in the chimpanzee, and one part is larger in the adult human. We have embryonic resemblances that we can see across species, right? A chick or a baby chicken, a mouse and a human, all three are going to look remarkably similar as embryos, right? So these are vertebrate embryos that are going to appear alike in early development. So we uh, put genetics in here um, at this point, just to show what are known as homeotic genes. Homeotic genes are going to be two homeotic genes that are expressed unequally, right? And we see in our first example for the chick, two homeotic genes are expressed unequally along the length of the chicken embryo. So both of those genes are expressed and no limbs are formed, all right? Here in the python, we see the same pair of homeotic genes that is going to prevent the development of four limbs in a python embryo, okay? So here for the chick, we see that we have an overlap of a gene. So homeotic gene A and homeotic gene B. The four limbs are going to develop into wings. The hind limbs develop into legs. Right? Here we have a homeotic overlap, right? And that is a complete homeotic blockage. So these genes are going to block four limb development completely in the python, whereas the hind limbs are going to remain vestigial. So here we see a couple of different animal species. And here we have what is known as cytochrome C. So cytochrome C is a genetic um, protein. It's going to be uh, fewer differences in uh, more developed species. So more recent, the shared ancestor, the fewer the differences in the amino acid sequence for this protein. So for example, chimpanzee is going to have no differences. The amino acid sequence of cytochrome C is exactly the same. The rhesus monkey has one difference. A rabbit has nine, cow 10, pigeon 12, all the way up to yeast, which has 40 differences. So we see that something like yeast or a fruit fly developed and diverted off from the common lineage far before something like a rhesus monkey did. So the common ancestor between humans and a rhesus monkey is much more recent than the common ancestor between a fruit fly and a human. Each genetic code or each cell has what is known as a molecular clock, right? So if a sequence of DNA is going to accumulate mutations at a constant rate, then there has to be a number of sequence changes that is going to dictate whether something is actually going to divert off and become a different species. So the amount of sequence changes can also be used to tell us the amount of time it has been since two species split. In this hypothetical example here, we see a common ancestor DNA sequence. And then at the point of species divergence, we see several mutations begin to occur. So at this point, we are looking at a lemur right on one side, and we are looking at another species of lemur on the other. So in this hypothetical example, Mutations occur about once every 25 million years. And that suggests that the two lemur species, in this case, diverged about 50 million years ago. All right, looking at a phylogenetic tree or a common lineage tree here, we can see that there's a common ancestor here, right? 
And as time goes forward, we have more and more divergences that take place, right? So this is looking at what is called the Najash. This is a fossil snake. A Najash is a very, very old fossil, one of the most primitive of the snakes. So all three types of extinct marine snakes with legs arose later after the Najash. So this suggests that snakes evolved on land and later colonized in water. So the marine fossil snakes were actually originally colonized on inland bases and migrated to the water. All right, so this is using evidence build up an evolutionary tree. Here we see an illustration of five lines of evidence that are going to understand the relationships between the heaven, uh, seven hypothetical species. So at first we find fossils and we age them and date them using radiometric dating. We see a couple of different ancestral lineages. We have a common ancestor one and a common ancestor two. From common ancestor one, we see the divergence of all seven of these species. However, we have a common ancestor two that is going to see divergence between species one and species two. That means that there's a common ancestor that exists much more recently here on this one island. So we're going to see biogeographical evidence that divergence happened on this island sooner than compared to the other islands. Okay. So on this first island, we see that the anatomical comparisons of the species, they have functional forelimbs and hind limbs. So they have four legs that are functional. The embryonic comparisons show that the homeotic gene A is going to be active throughout the development. That is going to show us that each one of these species has 98% similarity in the DNA sequence. For these three species on island two, we can see that there are three different splittings that go on here, right? That means that there's probably more variability. So the forelimbs and high limbs are absent as far as these species are concerned. The homeotic gene A is only briefly active during development, and they have a shared keratin sequence. Finally, for species six and seven, we see that this island, island three, has species that have vestigial forelimbs and hind limbs are absent. The homeotic gene is going to be inactive throughout development, and they have an identical cytochrome C. All right. So that was evolution, evolutionary theory, and evidence of evolution as far as the history of Earth is concerned. Go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. Also visit the Patreon, patreon.com slash twisted science for more videos. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate it. I will see you next time. Take care.